So my name is Saori Yen. I'm an oncology dietitian at Cedar sinai I'm very happy to be here to share some evidence-based information on cancer and nutrition. Great, thank you for confirming. So let's get started. There was so much that I wanted to share with you, but since um, we have limited time, I, I wanted to focus on things that come up a lot in my practice. So whether there are questions or concerns about cancer nutrition. So I hope that some of the topics we're gonna to discuss today will resonate with you. But if there's anything in particular that you want me to talk about, um, please let me know at the end of the presentation. So I would like to know, um, I can't see you, but how many of you know the difference between a dietitian and a nutritionist? Because I think many people might use the terms, two terms interchangeably, but there is a big difference. So I just wanted to clarify what the, the differences are. So in the US, the term nutritionist is actually not a legally protected term, meaning anyone can pretty much call him or herself a nutritionist without proper education and training. So what you want to be looking for if you're looking for a nutrition professional is to look for a registered dietitian. So as a registered dietitian, we have to go through an accredited program, a year long dietetic internship before we can sit for the national board exam. And many of us do have at least a master's degree and we're the only nutrition prof professionals that can provide what's called medical nutrition therapy for uh, disease management such, such as cancer. And some of us also have a special certification um, such as CSO, which stands for Board Certified Specialist in Oncology Nutrition. And if you've never met with a dietitian before, I just wanted to share with you some of the things that we can help you with. So we do use evidence-based information to provide recommendations that are specific and unique to you. Um, so that's, that might be the difference between searching for things online or you know, from books, um, because we work with you one-on-one -on -one to make sure um, that we together come up with strategies to help you meet, uh, uh, help you reach your nutrition goals. And during treatment, especially, we can help prevent or minimize nutrition-related side effects. So that could be maybe decreased appetite, nausea, uh, changes in your bowel pattern, things like that. We often have to help debunk cancer nutrition myths that are out there and translate research findings. We often discuss supplement use, drug and nutrient interactions, therapeutic diets, in some cases, artificial nutrition, like tooth feeding or IV nutrition. And of course, we provide individualized counseling to reduce the risk of cancer recurrence. So again, thank you for joining me. You're at the right place if, you, if any of the following applies to you. So if you feel overwhelmed and confused about nutrition advice, then you're at the right place. Um, if you're concerned that certain foods might be bad for cancer, then we'll talk about that too. And lastly, if you want to do everything in your power to fuel your body the right way to fight cancer, then you're at the right place. Let's jump right in. If you're confused about cancer and nutrition, you're definitely not alone, um, you know, especially the internet, internet, but even before the internet, many cancer patients heard, you know, um, different recommendations, advice from well-intended people, um, but it can be confusing because there could be conflicting information that you're coming across. So let's talk about how to tell if nutrition information is true or false. I'm not sure if you've ever seen anything like this. This is called the hierarchy of evidence. So ne the next time you come across any intriguing nutrition headline or book or advice, I want you to dig a little bit deeper to see where that information is coming from. So if you look at this pyramid, at the bottom, we have non-human studies, animal studies or studies done in a petri dish, for example. Those are considered to have the lowest level of evidence and lowest, lowest applicability to your life. Now, if we go all the way to the top, we have something called meta-analyses or systematic reviews, where researchers combine multiple good quality studies with a huge sample size to come up with a conclusion. So there is definitely, um, you know, there is a difference in uh, when we look at different levels of evidence to see if we should, um, you know, how serious we should take that information. 
Now, unfortunately, um, there are many, you know, there are people, companies, industries who might care more about profit than your health. So we have to be always cautious as a consumer in general, what we consume, but also the information that we consume. Here are some, just some of the nutrition red flags that I want you to be mindful about. So some might be obvious, like if something promises a quick fix, if something sounds too good to be true, those are definitely nutrition red flags. If their advice is not backed, backed up by anybody else, especially large credible organizations, that could be a red flag. Um, if it's funded, you wanna look at the funding as well if possible, if a particular company is funding the research and they're trying to sell you something, that could also be a, a red flag. And in case you're wondering, here are just, uh, you know, a selected few credible nutrition related organizations. American Institute for Cancer Research is wonderful. Uh, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which is the governing agency for registered dietitians. There's also a subgroup for oncology nutrition. So um, that is open to the public. And if you're looking for anti-cancer recipes, cookforyourlife.org is a great resource that I recommend. Now, I want to talk about having fear around food, which seems to be um, quite common, unfortunately because people may have told you that, oh, if you have cancer, you shouldn't eat this. So I, I want to remove the fear by looking at the evidence. So let's jump right in. So first, of course, I have to bring up sugar um, because many of us have heard that sugar feeds cancer. And is that true? So it's both true and false, depending on what you mean by sugar feeds cancer. There is a difference between naturally, naturally occurring sugar, like the sugar that you might find in fruits or dairy products, for example, versus added sugar. So things like table sugar, honey, maple syrup, things like that. There is a difference there. And we, if we're talking about blood sugar, like glucose, then we have to realize that glucose feeds both our healthy cells and cancer cells. And it's true that cancer cells have a different metabolism. They are rapidly growing and they might use up more glucose. However, it doesn't mean that we can tell our food where to go. Um, and even if you stop eating added sugar completely, unfortunately, cancer cells are very smart. They will find other ways to fuel itself and its growth. So the current recommendation is to minimize added sugar to about 10% of your total calorie needs per day. So for instance, if you consume about 2000 calories, that would be about 50 grams of sugar or about uh, less than four tablespoons of sugar per day. Now, how about carbs? Um, you may, recently, I think there are more hot topics might be ketogenic diet, intermittent fasting. Um, how about, shouldn't we be following a low carb diet? Well, it depends on what we mean by low carb. So carbs are, you know, it, it's the main energy source for humans. Our brain thrives on glucose. There is a difference, again, between complex carbs and simple or processed carbs. And we know that most Americans, unfortunately, we don't get enough fiber that comes from complex carbs. So we actually want to be increasing the types of complex carbs. Um, so things like whole fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes like your beans, uh, chickpeas, lentils, nuts and seeds. Those are great sources uh, of fiber. How about red meat? So red meat, and there is red meat and there's processed meat. So there is some convincing evidence that red meat can increase the risk of certain types of cancer, such as uh, colorectal cancer, for example. So the recommendation is to limit your intake of red meat to 12 to 18 cooked ounces per week. And for processed meat, since there is a stronger evidence, the recommendation is to avoid if possible. And what matters also is not just the quantity of red meat that we eat, but also how we cook them. So we really want to avoid cooking it at a high temperature um, or charring it. And um, 
and also also um sorry i was looking at the chat box um cooking uh we want to avoid cooking it at a high temperature also picking a leaner cut of meat is also beneficial especially if you're barbecuing or something like that because the saturated fat that drops into the the coal um, that can create more carcinogen so you know having a smaller portion is helpful cooking at a lower temperature is helpful choosing a leaner cut is helpful. Marinating can actually have a protective effect if you're grilling or like barbecuing. You can also partially pre-cook, meaning you don't have to cook at a high temperature um, from the beginning to the end. And the next one that I wanted to talk about is dairy. Isn't dairy bad for cancer? And not necessarily. There is, um, if you are, of course, you know, lactose intolerant or something like that, you do not need to consume dairy. But there, there are dairy offers a lot of beneficial nutrients, things like calcium, vitamin D, protein. And if you consume something like kefir, it can have probiotics that are good for your gut and your immune system. There seems to be a difference between non-fat or low-fat versus whole milk products. But again, it depends on what your nutrition goals are. So if, you, if you're trying to gain weight, then whole milk can be helpful. But if you do not have that goal, then perhaps you can stay with a non-fat or low-fat to limit your intake of saturated fat coming from animals. And if you do not consume dairy and want to meet your calcium needs from food, I recommend choosing non-dairy milk, for example, that is fortified with calcium and vitamin D, as well as you can try tofu that's made with calcium, or if you like small, uh, small fish with edibles, uh, edible bones, that could be a great source, as well as some leafy green vegetables. And lastly, um, alcohol. So alcohol does contain ethanol, which is known to be a carcinogen. And when we consume alcohol, it actually forms another type of carcinogen in our body. And what's worse, it, when we drink alcohol and consume a dietary form of carcinogen, let's say it's, you know, barbecued hot dog or something, then the alcohol helps that carcinogen penetrate more into our body. So the recommendation by the American Institute for Cancer Research is actually to avoid alcohol altogether if that's an option. Um, but if you choose to drink, um, then limit it to one drink per day for women and two drinks per day for men. Now let's switch gears to talk about what our body needs to thrive. So I really want to emphasize that I want nutrition, I want you to make nutrition work for you and not the other way around, meaning there is no need to follow some strict diet and be stressed about eating. There is more than one way to eat um, to fuel your body the right way. So if you can remember the hierarchy of evidence pyramid, if, if you remember at the top, we had systematic reviews and meta-analyses where you know, researchers look at multiple studies um, and come up with a conclusion. So when we look at decades of research and where we are today, the current recommendation is to follow a plant-forward eating pattern that are minimally processed. So it doesn't mean that you need to become a strict vegan or a vegetarian. You can have some animal foods as well, but we want you to incorporate more plant foods. So again, things like whole grains, different types, vegetables, colorful fruits um, and legumes, uh, including soy foods. And why is that? Why does this type of eating pattern seem to be effective for reducing cancer risk? And a part of it seems to be the phytonutrients that are in plant foods. So phytonutrients are nutrients that are only found in plants and there are thousands of them. You may have heard about a few like carotenoids or lycopene or isoflavones. So those are different phytonutrients that protect the plants when they're growing, but that they also seem to have different anti-cancer mechanisms after we consume them. And of course, plant foods also have a variety of vitamins, minerals, fiber, and the good thing is that they seem to have synergistic effects, meaning one plus one doesn't equal two. One plus one seems to equal more than two, meaning if you have a variety of colorful plant-based foods on your plate and eat them together, they seem to have a beneficial added effects. 
Now here's a just a quick visual of uh, what's recommended. So I know it's almost lunchtime, so perhaps you can keep this you know picture in mind. So on the left side we have the old American plate. So um, you know a big piece of steak with mashed potatoes and a starchy vegetable. And there's you can have these foods if you like them, but the the recommendation is to move um, away from a huge piece of you know animal based food and a lot of starchy food to more um, you know, non-starchy vegetables, a smaller portion of um, animal-based food. So if we can try to, to make more than two-thirds of, of our plate coming from plant foods and less than one-third of our plate coming from animal-based foods, that would be ideal. And if you are interested in learning more about various foods and the phytonutrients and the anti-cancer properties that they provide, I recommend going to American Institute for Cancer Research website. They have a page called Foods That Fight Cancer, and you can click on each of these foods to see what type of research has been done. Again, I want to emphasize that there is no one right way to eat. Um, and this is true, especially when it comes to cultural foods, because you know we might see that kale is good for you, broccoli is good for you, but we might never see some, um, some ingredients that we're familiar with that are not very mainstream. Just because they're not talked about doesn't mean they don't have nutrition or even cancer fighting properties. So I want to make sure that um, if you're not sure, ask a dietitian. Um, there is a way to eat in a healthful way, um, regardless of your preference or your budget or lifestyle. What matters more is that you're eating adequately and having a variety of foods. And for some of us, we might need to review our portion size of certain things or proportion of what's on our plate. But again, don't worry too much about specific nutrients or superfoods. What matters more is your overall eating pattern. It's always good to um, have that, you know, have that perspective um, and not get caught up in tiny little details. Um, and especially during treatment, we might have to shift priorities as needed. So keeping a, an open mind, it, it can be crucial because yes, there may be an ideal way to eat, but if you don't have a good appetite, if you're feeling nauseous, if you're having GI symptoms, then it might not be possible. But that's also where a dietitian can help you. So if you are having any questions or any issues, please reach out to your oncologist and ask for a, uh, a referral for a dietitian. And here's a quick nutrition checklist during, especially during treatment. Um, so regardless of your preference of, or, or you know, preference of eating, I want everyone to make sure that they're getting enough calories so you're not losing weight unintentionally and especially your muscle mass. I wanna make sure you're having protein with every meal, drinking enough li uh, fluids, again, whole foods, plant-based foods, optimizing medications to control your symptoms. And you might have to adjust eating pattern with this with the help of a dietitian. And supplements is a whole nother topic, but we do re uh, recommend avoiding supplements that might not be clinically indicated. And of course, always discuss with your provider and stay physically active if that is possible for you. Now, if there is something that you are not able to check off from the previous slide, or if you have any other nutrition related goal for you, I wanna briefly talk about how you can change your eating habit. I view every meal as an opportunity to nourish your body. Um, so, you know, let's say it's a special occasion, you're traveling and, you know, you enjoy, you enjoy yourself. That's perfectly fine. The next meal is another opportunity um, to, you know, to start fresh. The best advice that I can uh, provide is to start small and be consistent. That's the best way to create a new habit. Um, it might start with self-reflection to see what you want to work on, what your weaknesses might be, what some of the obstacles might be to achieving your nutrition related goal. Experimenting is, is important. So, you know, one way to, you know, there's more than one way to achieve a nutrition related goal. And have, having a buddy system or accountability partner can be very helpful as well. And keeping track of progress can be rewarding. And I want us to focus on progress, not perfection. Um, planning for setbacks is very um, important because that's expected, that's part of the, the journey. 
So um, if there are three things that you could take away or remember from this presentation is that number one, I want you to seek nutrition guidance from a trusted evidence-based source. And number two, what matters most is your overall eating pattern. Don't stress so much about a single meal or an ingredient or nutrient. And number three, I want, I want you to make nutrition work for you, not the other way around. Personal personalization is key. So thank you so much for your interest and attention. I, I'm ready for any questions that you might have. Perfect. Thank you, Sauri. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Yay. We finally got it. Okay. Um, excellent. Are there any questions from the audience here in the room? Okay, I believe there are some online. I'm gonna turn it over to Kaylee's. Yes, thank you. Uh, so the first question online was, can you clarify the sugar recommendation of 50 grams a day? Is that just for added sugar or all sugar, including naturally occurring sugar? Yeah, thank you for that question. It's for added sugar. And 50 grams is 50 grams is it's based on a 2000 calorie diet. So depending on what your personal needs are, it could be less or more. Thank you. Uh, somebody else asked, can you talk a bit about nutrition during chemo? Eating can be a challenge and avoiding eating uh, only applesauce and crackers. Yeah, that's, um, I hope if you're getting chemo, I hope you also have access to a dietitian wherever you're getting treated. So if you're, you know, if only applesauce and crackers sound good to you, I wonder if you're having decreased appetite or nausea. Um, I do want to make sure that your nausea is well managed with medications, first of all. And there are so many other things that you can try that are refreshing. And um, but things like applesauce, that's great. Um, crackers, that's, you know, I see those two as two different groups. So refreshing food and crackers, dry starchy food, not just crackers, but toast, pretzels, um, uh, dry cereal, those are helpful. Um, and I also want, want you to stay hydrated as, hydrated as well. There are also clear liquid protein drinks that might be helpful if you, if you feel that regular smoothies and shakes um, are, are too heavy. But I recommend optimizing your medication and working with a dietitian to come up with uh, different ways. So especially because with the applesauce and crackers, you're not getting any protein. So um, I hope you get one-on-one -on -one, um, assistance with that. Thank you. Another person asked if you could say a little bit about shifting focus from calories to macronutrients. Um, okay, so... I wonder, um, I wonder if, if I can get a little bit of clarification, shifting focus from calories to macronutrients. I wonder um, if the audience is asking like how much carbs you should have and protein and fats. So that's individualized, but when it comes to um, going through cancer treatment, especially, we do focus on calories and protein next. So depending again on you know, it, it's difficult to say without knowing you. So for example, if somebody also has a kidney condition, then we can't um, overdo the protein either, depending on their level of disease. But in general, um, we want you to, and, and it also depends pediatric or, or adult patient. But if you're an adult patient with no kidney issue, I would recommend to consume at least 1.2 grams per kilogram of body weight of protein per day. Thank you. Yeah, they just clarified that, oh. you know, the calories are not the main metric. I think they might be talking about counting and shifting, but you answered that well. Okay. Um, another person said, do you agree that prepackaged healthy meals are often processed and high in sodium and that preparing your own meals is more favorable? Um, I think that really depends. I highly encourage looking at the nutrition label. So the nutrition facts panel and the ingredient list, prepackaged meals can be very helpful for patients who don't have 
a good support and they don't have the energy to cook. So I don't write it off as, you know, do not eat. I don't write off anything as do not eat. So it just depends on, you know, not necessarily the brand name. I would really look at the individual product that you're interested in to see if it actually has a lot of, you know, um, sodium or whatever um, nutrient you might be concerned with. Thanks. Another person asked, should my doctors be telling me what my calorie goals are during treatment versus pre-treatment? So from my experience, it's usually the dietitians who will help with that. But um, I, I believe some doctors, um, I would say I encourage you to, um, to get a referral to the, to the dietitian because from my experience working with oncologists, anything related to nutrition, they just defer to a dietitian, um, and they can definitely help with, um, you know, with medical, um, making other medical decisions. Okay, thank you. And the last question, um, somebody said, I have been following the Budwig diet. Have you heard of this? It's similar to keto. Yes. Um, so there are many, um, many diets like the Budwig diet. Um, so Budwig diet in specifically, it's not, it doesn't have um, scientific evidence to recommend it. There could actually be potential nutrient deficiencies or other concerns. So again, um, if you've been following it, I think it would be helpful for a dietitian to take a look to see if there's anything, any concerns.